You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. American Idol goes all over the nation. The hometowns big and small. In search of America's next superstar. ABC Sundays. You make dreams come true. Home is where the dream starts. Music tells our own personal story. Idol is where the dream takes off. I did the biggest thing I thought I could do when auditioned for American Idol. You're going to Hollywood. You make dreams come true. American Idol, new Sundays, 8, 7 central on ABC and stream on Hulu. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident fanalist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore net app. So I did decide to take the day off yesterday. Nothing really important happened. Um, I also didn't get any video work done yesterday, which I'm a little bit ashamed of, but uh, I decided to give myself a day off. Also, I just thought I'd throw this out there just so you know, this isn't necessarily the new normal i'm not planning on taking days off during the regular season at all this is going to be back to the seven day a week grind um i just figure in the off season um number one there's not that much to talk about although i managed to do it last year um the audience size although i am impressed with how much it's staying up it is down to about probably half and so i figure you know give myself a little bit of a break. If I decide to take a day or two off on the weekend, I'm going to let myself do that. But again, just so you know, 100,000%, if there is a football season, I intend to, uh, we're, we're doing seven days a week. There's there's no question about that. Uh, the plan for today, I do want to go through Aaron Rodgers' interview. I don't know, I don't know exactly how that's going to go, because the interview, I want to actually play his responses. His interview is about a half hour, plus my comments. I don't know. I, the, the, the timeline is going to be tricky, but I'm going to try to make it work. And then um, I've, I've actually got several days kind of planned out. I do want to do tomorrow looking at our undrafted free agents a bit, as well as our draft pick. Essentially what I want to do, or what I have done already, is I've got my 2020 big board, right, that, that aggregates all the other national big board. And what I never actually did before was take all our guys and our undrafted free agents and just look at it. And it was actually pretty shocking. The way the, say, national media ranked everybody is very different than how guys actually fell. In other words, there were one of, let me just put it this way, and you can probably figure out who I'm talking about. One of our seventh round picks was our fourth highest overall value, according to what the national media had. There are also undrafted free agents that were ranked higher than some of the guys we drafted. So it'll be good to kind of go through and and look at these guys and say, look, you know, if there's somebody that could potentially have a breakout, it could be this. And then I also looked at some of the highest ranks. I'll, I'll just tell you, it's Jonathan Garvin, the edge rusher. A lot of people really liked him. I think Joe Marino actually had him ranked in his top 100. So anyways, it'll be little nuggets like that that'll be interesting to kind of look at, and I want to go through all that and, and, and finally look at some of these undrafted free agents. And then, let's see, so that'll be Tuesday on Wednesday. What I decided to do is reach out to some of these guys who had really high ranks on some of our players because obviously a lot of people weren't very thrilled with where we took some guys. And so on Wednesday, I want to uh, play my interview with Colin Lindsay from the Great Blue North Draft Report. Um, they are a one of the National Big Board's great website. Um, I talked with Colin. He had been around. He said he's been a fan of football since the 50s. He's been involved in the draft since the 70s. And so he's been doing big boards and, and following these drafts for a, a real long time. He was a, a real fun person to talk to. Just You can tell he's been doing this a long time. He had um, Jordan Love ranked very, very highly. And so I talked with him and then also just kind of went through the draft. And then on, I guess, Thursday, I also talked with Mark Jarvis. He's been on a couple times already, but he had, who was it, DeGuara and Stepaniak higher than anybody else. So I wanted him to talk about them and then once again, just kind of run through the draft overall. So we've got almost the whole week pretty well planned out pending any kind of craziness going on. Hopefully, well, eh, I don't know. Do I want there to be craziness? I don't think so. I mean, it could be good news craziness, but 
I don't want to chance it. The way things have been going, <laughs> if, if anything crazy happens, I have a feeling it's going to be horrible. Just based on how the year has gone thus far. But anyways, that is the plan. By the way, if you're curious about that website, it's gbnreport.com. Again, it's a, it's a great website. There's a lot of real nice... Uh, nice is a weird adjective... I should know that, but eh, hated English. As you can tell by me not putting S's on the ends of my words. That's my rebellion against the English language. <laughs> uh, anyways, again, today is going to be the interview. I probably shouldn't be rambling too much because we got a lot to pack into, not a ton of time. However, I do have some thank yous to hand out. I can't exactly remember where I left off, but I do want to make sure to say thank you to Ben for uh, upping his pledge on Patreon. Thank you to to Paula for doing the same thing, as well as Will. Um, Ben, Paula, and Will all increased how much they're giving on Patreon, and I really, really appreciate that. Again, I'm just kind of blown away that things are actually going up a little bit on Patreon during um, this pandemic and shutdown and everything, which was not my expectation. So thank you all very much for your support. Thank you to Kyle once again for uh, the support on Venmo. That is an option for anybody that's interested. And I don't remember if I... I don't think I did say thank you to Martin also. Martin also hit me up on Venmo. So it's been a very generous week this past week, and I really do appreciate that. And since I'm feeling all happy, toasty, touchy-feely, a couple other thank yous. I want to thank J.J. Leahy for trying to help me out quite a bit, at least as far as advising me with uh, social media stuff. Thanks to Jacob Buss for his help on Instagram. And then finally, my uh, Trello team. I know I haven't been in much contact with all of you, but I got a lot of stuff going on. And also, I've done this once before with having people try to help me with the show. And almost everybody kind of just slowly disappeared over time. I've kind of been waiting to see who was going to be the last ones standing. And that picture's come a little bit more into focus. So I'll be in contact relatively shortly uh, with you guys. So just, just hang in there for a little bit longer. But I do appreciate all the work that's going into that with helping me try to find content during the off-season. But finally, and some of you maybe saw this in the Facebook group or on the Facebook page. Make sure you are in the Facebook group and like the Facebook page. You may have thought I was kidding when I said I want recipe ideas. I was not. I thought, considering I really like cooking, and believe me, I'm not... I wouldn't say I'm a good cook. There's a website out there, I think it's called Dude Foods, that's basically just a bunch of ridiculousness that you know probably tastes good, but also if you eat stuff like that more than once a year, um, you're you're cutting your lifespan by about 10%. That's sort of, if I say I like cooking or even that I'm a good cook, it's that I, I do a good job of coming up with that kind of stuff. I like being creative and coming up with my own recipes that I would enjoy and a certain demographic would enjoy and Gordon Ramsay would, would throw it in my face, if that makes sense. But I want to do that, and with my newfound love of grilling, now that I finally got my Weber charcoal grill, been grilling almost every day, adding that to the repertoire, I really would like, as weird as it sounds, to have a Green Bay Packers-inspired recipe book. I'm not actually going to make a book, I just figure some throw it on a spreadsheet or something for fun. But I'm doing this with or without your help, and I would prefer to have your help. Already got the Jace Sternberger on the list. Got to do something Gilbert Brown related. I'm not sure if I'm going to go with Gilbert Brown Burger. Maybe. There's probably going to be like 17 different burgers, and that's fine. I'm very fine with that. But I feel like it's hard to create a burger that fully represents Gilbert Brown unless it's an 8-pound burger, which is which is doable. Let's, let's be honest. We can do that. Um, I do like the Don BBQ idea. Brilliant. Jared Cookies, maybe. Martellus Eggs Benedict, probably not, because uh, I don't want to make eggs... Well, I mean, maybe, but I don't like Martellus Bennett, and I don't want to put him in a Packers-inspired anything. Equinemius St. Brownies is brilliant. That's absolutely going to be on there. Darius Shepherd's Pie is 100% going to be on there, just because I want to make Shepherd's Pie. And again, it's not going to be Shepherd's Pie. It's going to be my interpretation of Shepherd's Pie, which means no vegetables, and I'm using beef and not lamb. Because why would I... What? Why? Yes, it's technically a cottage pie then. I Again, I don't care. My recipe book, I do whatever I want. Those were uh, from the Facebook group. 
Additional ideas I had thought of. Adrian Amos, something to do with famous Amos cookies. A.J. Dillon's nickname is The Sauce, so, you know, do something with that. Reggie Bagleton, maybe? I don't know. The Billy Turnovers, right? Like like Billy Turner, but it's a turnover. You know, they're not all great, but it gets a little difficult uh, for a while. And it doesn't have to be a play on their name. That's I'm kind of stuck on that. But, for example, I looked it up. Aaron Rodgers, apparently one of his favorite things to eat is white cake and ice cream. So that could be a thing, you know. Call it, like, goat cake or something. I, you know, I don't know. Brett Favre's favorite food is gumbo, which, again, I'm not making real gumbo, but I would be happy to make my own interpretation of a gumbo. It just sounds delicious. Like, oh, I don't know. Let's put rice and some sauce and a, about 17 pounds of meat into a dish and eat it. Oh, yeah, that's okay. Jordy Nelson's got to have something to do with steak because, you know, he's got, like, a thousand head of cattle. A steak sandwich or something. And then I've also got some of my own things that I like to make that are just creations of my own that I have assigned two players already. So I got the uh, Balaga Bombs, Bakhti Bars. Rashawn Gary's nickname is Big Ra, so I'm going to be making the Big Rocco, as in taco. And then Montravius is going to be the Monstravius, like monster. Just, you know what, again, they're not all gems, but that's why I need your help. So think it over. There is a post in the group. If you can find it, put it in there. Otherwise, just message me. I'll add it to my list. Very very, if you, I mean, if you know me well enough to know how excited I get about food, you know that I'm 100,000% serious about doing this. Otherwise, uh, I guess that's good enough. Oh, okay, promise this is the last thing. Um, there is a, uh, if you go in the Facebook group, the very top post that I have pinned there is how to get notifications on uh, Apple iTunes. I have an Android phone, and I typically use Google, uh, Google Podcasts. They did an update recently. And I just recently subscribed to a new podcast, and it says, would you like to get notifications? And I'm like, I've never seen this before. That's weird. And so I went to my podcast, clicked on subscribe, and it didn't unsubscribe me. It popped up this message, would you like to get notifications? And I turned notifications on for my show. If you're using Google Podcasts, go to the Packernet Podcast, click on subscribed, and then turn on the notifications. That way, you'll never miss a show. And again, if you're an iTunes user and you want to know how to turn on notifications, there is an article pinned to the top of the Facebook group. If you're a Spotify person, I don't think there's a way yet, but hopefully sooner than later. But anyways, let's take a break and uh, we'll try to rip through this um, this interview and kind of give some of the thoughts. I mean, there's not, it's nothing salacious, but that's kind of the reason we need to do this because everybody in the national media is making it seem like there's something salacious here. So we'll, we'll just listen to it together and kind of see what's there. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop, that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place, and you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. 
So again, and, and I don't know exactly how this is going to go with, with the time constraints. We probably won't play every comment, but I will start off with his initial comments, which again are very just generic. But the first question is, what do you think about the team now as opposed to last year? And it, it, I get the impression, and it makes sense. If you're in the media, you don't want to get nothing out of this interview. This is your opportunity to make serious headlines and to do that kind of stuff. So you don't want to cross the line and be obnoxious, but you also don't want to ask just basic softball questions. But in general, you get the impression that you want to, if he wants to complain, you want to give him a platform. Or if he wants to praise or whatever. But you kind of leave that open-ended and just see where it goes. So the first question is, compared to last year's roster, what do you think about this year's roster? I think that's kind of a good opening question to gauge where he's at. You know, a lot of people are fuming about it. I'm still getting messages about why in the world did we do what we do. And there's still some great points to be made about this not being the correct direction. Of course, you know, I'm over it. I've come to terms with it, and I'm willing to just see what happens. But where is Aaron Rodgers on this? So here was his response to that question. Yeah, I like where we're at. I like, uh, obviously, what we accomplished last year was pretty amazing. Um, You know, the additions that we brought in, and then, you know, having a first-year head coach with a new system, uh, I like our progression throughout the season. Obviously, we had a lot of success, won a lot of close games. Um, I like to, you know, I like where we're at. I think, you know, as always, we're going to be expecting, you know, those young players, whether they're rookies or second or third year guys, to to make that jump. And we're going to be calling on them to to play an even bigger role for us. We've, you know, obviously had some changes uh, with a few positions, but you know, I like what Brian has done, and um, you know, I obviously hope there's a season and, and hope we get a chance to. To get back together soon and, and start working on that chemistry and and, uh, and get excited about the season. So again, there's really nothing there, right? We can try to, to read between the lines, and I'm going to do my best to do that, which, you know, we're going to have to be discerning, and I'm going to ask you to understand the difference between me saying something definitively and me trying my best to try to figure out, just in my opinion, what's, what's going on behind the scenes. And that, that is less important than what we know, right? So in other words, as I've said a thousand times, my standard is what is he saying compared to what I would expect him to say? And I think the expectation at this point when he comes to do an interview is to give very vanilla type answers. And so I'm really looking for anything that deviates from that, and he doesn't deviate very much. Meaning at the same time, because Packer fans go to the opposite end of the spectrum oftentimes, Whereas the media tries to spin everything negatively, fans try to spin everything positively. And I think maybe fans sometimes take that a little bit too far as well because the expectation is for him to be positive. The expectation is for him to say, I, I, you know, I, I'm going to be great, the team's going to be great, the GM is great, the coach is great, everything's great. Now, the one thing that I will put out there, and granted, he's had a lot of time to process this, is that Aaron Rodgers typically does, to some degree, wear his, his emotions on his sleeve a bit. So again, it's not as though he couldn't mask it after all this time. But the one thing I will say throughout this is that I generally do believe he's being honest. I'm not saying he's lying when he says everything's great. But there's sort of a lot of tolerance in there in terms of how specific he's being. And there's going to be better examples of what I'm talking about. But, you know, when he says, starts talking about how great Alan Lazard is. You know, you can say that in a very general sense as far as you like him as a person, he did a good job as a football player, and it's kind of an easy throwaway. Or you go to the other end of the extreme where, no, no, you don't understand, this guy's legitimately a freak. Right? There's, there's a broad spectrum of what that could possibly mean, and he's got a lot of play in there that he can kind of dance around. I don't know if any of that makes sense, but how specific or how general he's being is kind of hard to gauge. But, but in general, I don't think he's lying. And I don't think they usually are lying. I just think when things are negative, they tend to go more broad in general. But anyways, let's continue on. Well, I think I was watching the draft. Uh, I was watching uh, the feed with A.J. Hawk and Pat McAfee and, and his boys. Um, and I think, you know, the general reaction at first was, was surprised. I think like many people, um, you know, obviously I'm not going to say that I was, you know, thrilled by by the pick necessarily, but I, I understand the organization is, is thinking not only about the, the present, but about the future. 
and I respect that. You know, I understand uh, uh, understand that their focus and their mindset, and obviously they thought that uh, he was such a great talent that uh, they needed to go up and get him. So, um, you know, I was like I said, generally surprised, but um, you know, it's it's what uh, it's what those guys are paid to do to put together a roster for now and, and for the future as well. So a couple notes on this. Number one, again, I don't think he's lying. But I do think it's entirely possible he was livid when this initially happened. Similar to, and the, the reason I say that, not that I know anything, but, again, he's had a lot of time to process this. We've heard a lot of people express that if it was them, they'd be upset. They know Aaron, and they believe him to be upset. And, and even Aaron Rodgers kind of said, in an offhand way, I'm not going to say I was necessarily thrilled about it, right? I, I mean... I think Aaron Rodgers is very similar to us, right? He's he's a human being like us, and he also has more invested in this team, being that it's his career, his team, his ability to win championships that are on the line. I don't expect him to be more or, or expect him to be less emotional about what's going on than us. And I think a lot of us can relate to the idea that when the pick happened, it was very upsetting, right? I'm sure he's excited. He's He's got... You know, maybe we're going to get this, maybe we're going to get that. You know, he's looking at it, and, and then they take a quarterback. It's upsetting. But like a lot of us, he's had time to process it. And I do believe 100% everything that he said to be legitimate. And you can kind of hear it in his voice. He has processed it and and is intelligent enough to understand nobody is in the wrong here. He's not mad at Brian Gutekunst because he legitimately, he's, he's not lying when he says he understands that that's his job. He knows that's his job. And while you can be upset personally because it doesn't benefit you he knows that this is what is right for the team not necessarily that it is right but that again the, the general philosophy is if, if this is the guy that can be the guy in the future the quarterback of the future this is the pick that the team makes 10 times out of 10 and they believe in his talent and he understands that this is the way it goes I, I generally believe it took him some time to process that just like it did for me and for a lot of you but I believe he's in a good spot right now. The only thing, and again, this is entirely speculation, the only thing that concerns me is sort of a straw that broke the camel's back moment for Aaron Rodgers, and not so much where he says, I, I'm done with this team, but a moment at which, and I, I do think he's probably at this moment, where he has kind of accepted his fate. Because I think it's hard to be at a point in your life where you have all the money you're ever going to need. You've got a great life. You've got, you know, he's got Danica, who he seems to be very happy with. Um, you know, he's, he's got his other business ventures in Wisconsin and his home in Wisconsin and everything that he has in Wisconsin, as well as his home now in California. I'm sure they've got plenty of things mapped out post-career and, and all kinds of stuff that they've got figured out. He has a great life. And I think it's kind of, you know, he's, he's again, he's got plans, and he's been talking about, it. I legitimately want to, and he, he's trying to keep the fire stoked. I want to play into my 40s. I want to play for the Green Bay Packers. I want to retire here when it's time for me to retire here. I've still got all this talent. I've still got all this stuff. I'm ready. I'm willing. I'm hungry. And I wonder if, as much as he's slowly been realizing, and he's been saying that he's realizing that he knows the end is kind of coming, I wonder if this was a giant, bucket of ice water on his fire again nobody did anything wrong but just kind of for him to realize you know this this is kind of it and I, i'm just saying it's kind of hard to have both to realize it's coming to an end green bay is already moving on not that they're gonna get rid of me in the next year or even two but they are looking to move on which has got to be hard because i mean you are the franchise and this team would have bent over backwards and done anything to make you happy over the last 15 years of your career because you are everything to not just the team but the entire state to now you realize and you've seen over the years guys that have had that level of respect including Brett Favre and Jordy and everything else where they they are so unbelievably valuable to the team these guys will wrap you in in bubble wrap just to to get you to your car to watch them just kick you out and and just turn a completely you know Mike McCarthy he had talked about how hurt he was by the way that they let him go. Apparently, Mark Murphy basically after the game just called him up and said, we're going to go in a different direction, and that was it. You know, after all these years, you know, Jordy, they offered him some piddly little amount that he knew, they, everybody knew was not going to work. It's just, it's just a very cold thing, and he, I'm sure he feels that cold shoulder a little bit. Again, he's still the man, but he knows it's it's coming to an end. And he knows that 
Although this is one of those things that you say, well, you, you always just take a quarterback when it's there. You know that there's some very strong, serious looks and also the realization that if Jordan Love ends up being a very good quarterback, not even necessarily as good as Aaron Rodgers in his prime, but if he can handle this offense, they're very likely going to move on. And so part of what I'm hearing in his voice is just, he's good with it. And as much as that's a good thing, and it's like, haha, national media, he doesn't care, he's not mad, it's also kind of a, he realizes that it is what it is, and this is out of his control, and he's going to do what he can, but, you know... They're going to they're gonna do what they're going to do, and I can only control what I can control. And again, he's got this other aspect of his life that he can control, which is everything outside of football he can control and does have a lot of power over. And I, I guess the only concern I have, again, you know, they keep talking about it, and there's another question that comes up about this chip on his shoulder, and we've been talking about that for 15 years. I really, really, really doubt at this point in his career, knowing he is going to be a first ballot Hall of Famer. He's already proved everybody wrong. He doesn't have a chip on his shoulder because of the 49ers. Come on now. And I'm not saying he's going to be a bad football player. I'm just saying that everything is kind of pulling on him. I'm, I'm, I'm not making a comment negatively about Aaron Rodgers. I'm talking about any single human being in his situation, how I feel like that would have to affect you. Essentially what I'm saying is I don't think Aaron Rodgers is superhuman to overcome all these factors. He is getting older. And and just just naturally by getting older it changes your demeanor. When you're 20 years old, I mean you're you're a force to be reckoned with. Just in your mind and everything else, you're just kind of a wild person. You know the the I'm going to take on the world and all this kind of stuff and I feel like that fire is is largely going to be in the the younger people. When you're pushing 40, it's like, you know, I mean I'm early 30s and I'm already feeling that you know, like when I go to the gym, I'm motivated, but it's it's very different motivations. When I was 18 years old, I, I was an animal. Now I'm just trying to be less fat and around for my kids for a while. You know, it's it's a different motivation. And even when I'm at home, it's like I'm trying to get all fired up and taking like a pre-workout. And then your daughter comes up and just like starts hanging on you. It's like, Stop, I'm trying to be crazy. You don't understand. You better back away. I'm dangerous. But then they just, you know, they start doing push-ups next to you, and it's like, oh, fine. Things change, is all I'm saying. And all the forces of the universe, if we can get weird with it, are pulling against Aaron Rodgers and making it hard for him to kind of come into this season. Everybody's talking about it. Even now, oh, you better watch out. You know, Bakhtiari, he, he's going to take the world by storm, man. This Jordan Love pick, he's going to be so mad, and he's just going to be the best quarterback in the world. I just, I don't think so. I think he's 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 doing rational, logical things. He's taking care of his body. He's getting his exercises in. He's got his routine and his regimen. He understands what to do. He's intelligent enough to understand the plays and all this stuff. And he's just going to go through it and do what he can do. And he's going to do the best he can. That's my expectation. So, anyways, moving on. Uh, after that was the question about how do you f- help him develop. Again, it's it's not an important question, but... I think listening to and hearing his tone of voice, I, I generally, genuinely believe in what he's saying. But again, keep what I said in the back of your mind in terms of him kind of accepting his fate. You don't want Aaron Rodgers to treat Jordan Love badly. But at the same time, what does it mean when you hear about Brett Favre treating Aaron Rodgers poorly? It doesn't make you happy, but the reason is because he wants his job. He's fighting for his job. And I'm not saying it's impossible to fight for your job and expect to win and have a chip on your shoulder and also treat him with respect. I'm not making that statement. But again, it all just kind of comes together into this picture in terms of him looking at Jordan Love and saying, this guy very likely is going to be the future and I'm going to do whatever I can to help him. And just, again, just kind of settling into where he where he's at and just kind of accepting it. It's good, but it's also not great. But here was his response to that. Well, Dennis, I would say the same it's the same that I've done with, with all my backup quarterbacks, and I, I feel great about those relationships that I've developed over the years. You know, many of them are, are still really close friends. You know, I consider Matt Flynn uh, a very close friend. I still have great contact with, uh, you know, a lot of guys I've played with over the years from, you know, from more recent to Deshaun and Manny to Tim and I are really close. Uh, Brett Hundley and I keep in touch all the time. Scotty Tolzien and I, you know, talk from time to time. So I've had great relationships over the years with those guys and, and expect to have the same type of relationship with Jordan. Um, you know, again, you know, it, uh, he didn't get asked to, to be drafted by the Packers. There's, there's nothing 
you know, he's not to blame at all. You know, he's just coming in excited about his opportunity. We had a great conversation the day after the draft, and and I'm excited to work with him. You know, he seems like a, a really good kid with his good head on his shoulders and uh, similar story, not heavily recruited out of college and kind of made his way at Utah State, and uh, we've had some good conversations. Again, there's there's nothing there, and I I, I – when he said that, it, it immediately made me think of his relationship with his backup quarterbacks, and it does seem to be positive. You see him laughing and goofing around and joking around, and that is what you want from a professional from Jordan Love. You don't want him to treat him poorly. I'm not in any way trying to put a negative spin. I'm just I'm just wondering. And again, the vibe I get is just more or less Aaron Rodgers has accepted what's happening. Which what else can you do? But again, it, it's it's just it's just I just feel like it's a natural human thing. There's this chip on the shoulder mentality of I'm gonna show everybody, and then there's kind of just a moment where your brain clicks over and says, you know what, this is kind of the twilight. We'll see what happens. You, you accept it. You know, it is what it is at that point. Um, anyways, then the next question is from Matt Schneidman about does this pick negatively impact your plans to retire a Packer into your 40s or something to, to that effect? And again, this is a guy who. I'm sure has been very angry and frustrated with certain things at times that has kind of just come to a point in his career where he says, it's, you know, it's out of my control. There's nothing I can do. I can just go out and play my best and whatever happens, happens. And I'm glad that he's not going to be giving anybody, any national media people, anything to work with. As much as they're trying, this is 100% a guy that is comfortable with his situation in life. As a Packer fan, I'm, 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 there's a tiny bit worried about that. But as far as the, the speculation from national media about him being upset about something, it's it's absolutely ridiculous. But here was his response to that. Well, I think what it does is just reinforce kind of the the, the adage that you can only control what you can control. And uh, it's always been, um, you know, a mantra uh, for myself. And I think any, you know, any great athlete, you know, there's things that are just out of our control. Um, that obviously is, is something that's very important to me, but I think is, you know, is definitely telling at this point that that is truly uh, something that's out of my control. What I can't control is how I play and making uh, that decision um, at some point a, a very hard one. Um, you know, if, if I were to retire in the organization's timetable, then it's an easy decision. But uh, if there comes a time where I still feel like I can play at a high level and and uh, my body feels great, um, you know, then there's, you know, other guys have, have, have gone on and played elsewhere. I will say this to put more of a, mo- a positive spin on this, since it's all speculation anyways. I legitimately believe, and I, I believe I've said this probably more than once, uh, when I talked about the comparisons, for example, to Drew Brees and how the tweaking of that offensive system, and especially getting the ball out of his hand quickly, a little bit more shorter passes has helped his career, especially toward the end of his career, and you see his completion percentage and just how efficient and awesome this offense is. What I have said for a while now is if he can settle into this offensive system and kind of let go of being a superhero and I got this and I want the big play and all this and just really, again, settle into this offensive system, I think he can have a great renaissance of his career. I think we can see a resurgence, some of the best years that he's had. Because let's be honest, he hasn't had, not that he's been bad ever, but I don't think anyone's considered him a top two or three quarterback in quite some time. A lot of that is just because of the emergence of other quarterbacks. But still, I mean, Aaron Rodgers has been seen as good, not great. And and, and some people are even trying to push him even further down than, than he's worthy or, or than is fair. But I But again, entirely speculation here, maybe him kind of letting go a little bit is going to help him. Because again, I do think part of the issue, and and it's my interpretation that it is an issue, and I'm not alone in this, his inability to simply play within the system, or, or it's not an inability, he has the ability, it's it's a, it's this constant feeling, and, and maybe it just comes from 10, 15 years of needing to put this team on his back and, and, and make plays outside of the design in order for this team to stay alive. Maybe it's hard to get that out of his system, but if he can kind of back off of that and just let go of the the feeling of, I'm going to show everybody that I'm the best quarterback and I've still got this great arm and I can still thread the needle and all that and just kind of say, you know what, if we're going to dink and dunk this and run the ball more, fine, I'll just, I'll just do it. 
And as a result, we end up seeing, again, sort of a Drew Brees effect, where Drew, you know, everybody said Drew was a, a good quarterback. Nobody ever really doubted that, but it's only been in the last couple of years where he's been considered one of the top. And again, it's only because guys like Pat Mahomes are in the NFL that he isn't easily the top quarterback. Again, passer or uh, completion percentage like has never been seen before. Let me put it this way. This is probably the only time since the two have been playing together that Drew Brees is probably comfortably being put above Aaron Rodgers as a quarterback. Maybe not by Packer fans, but I would guess if you were to ask around how he played in 2019, probably, you know, the last couple of years, Drew Brees has been put probably rightly so ahead of Rodgers. Again, Rodgers still has the arm talent to make throws that nobody else can make, but there's also a lot of negative mixed in there. And so again, my, my biggest hope is that Matt LaFleur is able to run this offense the way that he wants to, that we get that that change that we see in a lot of other teams. I did that episode showing how the 49ers, after about three years, finally changed over the Redskins, the Rams, the the Broncos in the 90s, right? Usually there's that first year where we kind of just stick with whatever we have. And then after, by the second year, maybe the third, but usually the second, ideally, we're running this thing the way that I want to. And if Matt LaFleur decides to make that change and utilize A.J. Dillon and DeGuara and Jace and Devontae, and if Aaron Rodgers can really, really settle into this and we run this, whereas, again, last year was kind of a we're going to find a way to blend what Aaron has done his career with what I like to do and just say, look, I, I really want to start pushing. Not that we're going to completely cut out everything you love, but I want to push kind of hard in the direction that I want to go. If Aaron can settle into that, I just I think I think a lot of people can be shocked as to how good this offense can be. I'm not predicting it that it will happen, but also I also don't think it's 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 being talked about enough. The the potential of this team offensively is about as high as just about any other team. Again, you look at the San Francisco 49ers and what they have. Granted, we don't have a tight end as good as they have, but I would say we have a better offensive line. We have a by a mile, a better quarterback. We have a better number one wide receiver. We now have, I believe, probably two better running backs than they have on their entire roster. I mean, just, just again, look at the Tennessee Titans and what they were able to do just by having this thing sort of click, which, again, was, was more or less implemented by Matt LaFleur. That was when things really took off with Derrick Henry and the offensive line and getting that whole thing moving. Derrick Henry was kind of just a nobody for for several years until Matt LaFleur got there. And it wasn't until the second half of the year. It took some time to get that all rolling. A lot of it is the offensive line getting in sync and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I I am excited about it. And there are certain things that have to to fall into play. Um, The tight ends and and their upward potential and, and, you know, Jace's ability to step up and DeGuara's ability, which, which again, I'm comfortable with because Jace is going into his second year. Granted, he was hurt most of the year, but he's also going to be filling out a completely different role. He was not split out very often. He was put in line, which I don't think is, is his best, the best way to utilize his talents. And now he's going to be taking over for what Jimmy was doing, which is probably roughly 50% of the time he's going to be split out in the slot. I think that's going to more adequately fill out what he does and then DeGuara again it's his first year but remember he's been running a similar system to what Matt LaFleur is going to want him to do and he's been at Cincinnati for five years if anybody's going to come in here and start right away especially during this pandemic when when it's hard to get practice reps in if there's anybody that's going to come in and be able to meet his full potential early DeGuara is the guy but again the the biggest piece of this puzzle is Aaron Rodgers and again his his upward ability the, the potential of this offense with Aaron Rodgers meeting that full potential is really, really high. Again, I'm not projecting that, but I am saying it's a possibility. And again, maybe this does work to our advantage. Maybe Aaron Rodgers kind of letting go a little bit of the feeling of, you know, I know more than you. I don't need to listen to you. You know, trust me. I got this. We're not doing that. I don't want to check it down. I can hit this guy down the field, you know maybe just letting go a little bit and and settling into this is going to help the team a little bit. Again, all speculation, but it is worth worth thinking about. And again, they don't get enough credit. We hear all the time about the the downward potential of the team. Even after a 13 and 3 season with everybody with LaFleur going into his second year and all this stuff, it's still assumed they're going to get what nine wins is what they're projected. We know how bad it could be, but why is nobody talking about how amazingly awesome it could be? 
well, I'm, I'm, I'm at least going to mention it. We are getting short on time, but we'll, we'll do what we can do here. But uh, the next question is, you know, you lost Jimmy and we didn't really add anybody. How are you feeling about the guys you have? And this is where I think maybe Packer fans take it a bit too far, right? I didn't listen to this right away, but instantly I start seeing things about, oh man, he talked about Lazar right away. He must really, really like him the most. He's really excited about him. He thinks he's going to be an elite. Just, just kind of fill in the blank type stuff, which granted, that's what I've been doing this whole time. I just don't agree with the assessment. So here is what he said in regard to his guys. Well, I think there's some interesting things to look at. I think you look at the development of a guy like Alan Lazard, what he did last year, and his uh, versatility. You know, he's a guy who's cut uh, at the end of training camp and then quickly put back on the roster, I think, week one maybe. Um, and by the end of the season, you know, he was uh, called upon many, many times uh, in important situations uh, to make big plays, and he did. Uh, he's a, you know, just a great, uh, a great teammate. A, a, you know, a, an ascending player. Loved his approach every week, and he made some big time plays for us. Um, I'm excited about getting EQ back from injury and seeing how he feels. Uh, he, you know, really made some great strides his rookie year, um, especially towards the end of the season, making plays for us and, and just kind of growing each week. He's got a great approach to the game. Uh, it'll be fun to see him healthy. Uh, MVS is a guy who I have a ton of uh, confidence in. I really feel like um, that it, that if he can continue to grow, that he can really um, add to our football team, and and, uh, and I look for him to make big strides. And then Jake Kumaro, obviously, as well, you know, such a such a steady guy. I've, I've been a big fan of his since the first time, you know, I threw a ball to him, I think, and just love his, uh, his approach to the game. Now, the tight end position, I was really excited to see Big Dog come back because I think he not only adds such a great uh, presence to our run-blocking scheme, but to our locker room. He's just a, a consummate professional, a fantastic leader for our football team, and bringing him back was an important uh, important part, I think, to, uh, to shoring up that room. Obviously, we saw with Jace uh, at the end of the season, giving him some opportunities. We're going to be expecting things from him and, and Bobby Tanyan as well, and, and we drafted a young kid in the third round as well. So, I think uh, I like the way that's looking. Um, obviously, you know, this is a different uh, different off season, and, and not many of us, myself, I have, but not many of us have gone through an off season where you're not really together physically. Um, we've managed it in 2011, and um, I think with these Zoom meetings and the installs we've been doing, I think we're going to be ready to go whenever that time comes, but uh, it'll be kind of a, an accelerated uh, learning curve for especially those young guys who are expected to play. So again, I, I'm not implying he's lying about anything, but right off the bat, the fact that he basically went through the entire roster should tell you that, you know, he's kind of just going through the motions of answering a question the way you're supposed to answer the media. So in other words, for me, it was less about, you guys are crazy, we have elite wide receivers, and more about, look, I, I like our guys, and just kind of went out and gave compliments to all his guys, especially with you know, as a leader of this team, your guys have been getting beat up for a while. We need a number two. Why? Well, apparently because Alan Lazard is garbage and MVS is garbage and EQ is garbage and Kumaro is garbage. Because I don't know why else, and Funches, by the way, is garbage. Why else would we need so desperately a number two wide receiver? And understand that is what you're saying when you say we need a number two wide receiver. You can't have it both ways. And a lot of people are. Because the end of last season, most Packer fans were telling me that Alan Lazard is a legit number two. You're out of your mind. You don't know what you're talking about. Elite, awesome, great, all that stuff. And then now suddenly it's unanimous we should have gotten a wide receiver. I don't know how that fits in. Maybe all the Alan Lazard truthers are still out there. They're just very quiet lately. Maybe they're hibernating. I don't know what happened. But I have not heard one person pipe up and say, you guys are nuts. We don't need a number two wide receiver. I don't even know why we got Funches. We have Alan Lazard. So again, he, he, he did mention Alan Lazard. That's true. But when he mentioned Alan Lazard, he was talking about development. That was the reason he mentioned him first. It wasn't because he believes he's this elite wide... And he does like him. Again, I'm not saying he's lying. But let's be honest about what he said. He talked about his development. He said he's a guy who was cut, and then we relied on him a lot toward the end of the year. And that's true. I don't think that means we necessarily have to believe that he is going to step up and be the next Devontae Adams. I think Alan Lazard is what he is, and he's a good football player, and that's great. And we're going to get production from him. But again, he went through the list of he really likes Kumar. And by the way, that's the other thing. Just because Rodgers likes a guy means nothing. In fact, it's almost a curse. It seems like everybody he says he likes, Packer fans jump on it and say he's going to be real good because Rodgers likes him, and he's not very good, and he ends up getting cut. He's liked Kumaro for a very long time. 
He liked Jimmy Graham and talked about how great Jimmy Graham's going to be, and you guys are going to be surprised, and just wait. Just like he really liked Martellus Bennett, and just wait, oh man, this guy's so good, and our chemistry's great, and da 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 And I keep talking about how everybody mentions, oh man, imagine how good he's going to be when, when, when Rodgers is his quarterback. We've literally never seen that. That's never been a thing once that I can point to. Martellus Bennett got significantly worse when he came here. Jimmy Graham had his worst years ever when he came here. Jared Cook had a good couple games in in the playoffs, but for the most part was just terrible for the most part of the bigger part of that year. So the Aaron Rodgers multiplier isn't a thing. Aaron Rodgers liking you doesn't make you a better player. Good players are good players, bad players are bad players. And again, the fact that he went through the whole roster and talked about Kumaro and he talked about MVS. Now the the one person he did seem to highlight was MVS. Now I'm kind of out on MVS, but obviously it's possible that he could something could work out here. And also, I don't know that it's 100% MVS's fault. I laid the blame at his feet because I, it was kind of a confusing situation. Aaron Rodgers was never able to hit him. Every single time MVS was open, Aaron Rodgers missed him. Now, I thought it was weird because every single time Devontae's open, he hits him right in stride. So, you know, it's hard to tell, you know, if you run at a, at a different angle, maybe you slow down, maybe you sped up, you know, th- there's, there's some kind of a thing in which these two are just not in sync. But I think if you put them in sync, and if you had Aaron Rodgers actually throw a good ball to MVS, MVS has a significantly higher, um, his statistics are a lot better. And again, maybe it's something MVS is doing wrong, maybe it's Aaron Rodgers doing something wrong, he just can't quite gauge that speed, I don't know what it is. But I think that's already one thing, and then there does need to be significant growth outside of that. But hopefully Aaron Rodgers is right. He is, he is, he did, if he, if he pinpointed anybody, it was MVS. But even he said, if he continues to grow. And in my opinion, that's a big if. He was a later round guy for a reason. We're we're betting on the upside. We've seen the upside. He's tall and he's fast. His ability to be a great receiver now is where he needs to take that next step. And the reason he went later is because there's concerns that he's not really going to be much more than his height and his speed. So I'm skeptical that there's going to be anything more from him, but I am excited about the potential of it. And again, you know, a lot of it could just be get those two getting in sync, which there's every reason to believe if, if MVS can't quite take a step, maybe Aaron Rodgers can in terms of, of, of getting more in sync with MVS and being able to throw to him and, and gauge what he's doing and, and all that stuff. I don't know. But I don't want to overestimate how great this team is going to be because he went through the entire roster and just talked about everybody positively. I just, I, I don't think that was really much of anything other than being complimentary and not trying to dump on his guys and be like, well, yeah, it kind of stinks that we didn't draft somebody because I'm stuck with Kumaro here. He likes his guys. He pointed out the upside. That's it. But I don't think there's really much else here. Anyways, we didn't even get through half of that. I, I, I was kind of worried that this would happen. I was hoping we can get through the whole thing, but it's hard to get through a 38-minute um, interview plus my comments in, in a timely manner. I was hoping to get through at least 10 minutes, which we did not, but I, I don't know. Uh, maybe, I don't know what to do now. Maybe tomorrow, rather than playing the audio, I'll just come up with a few other comments from this interview. But that's, again, there wasn't that much here. I think a lot of it is just general sort of coach speak. Um and again, the, the, the only thing I can really take away from this is, like most of us, the draft didn't go the way that he had hoped in a, in a perfect ideal world, but he's comfortable with where he's at in every aspect. He likes his guys. He likes his coach. He likes this team. He has his plans of, of you know, as you know, the next question was about his mo- external motivation. And he even went on to say, I don't really have any. He, he basically went on to say, that he's never really needed a lot of external motivation. Maybe that's true. I don't know. It's always been said that he plays with a chip on his shoulder. But either way, he said he doesn't really have that. His biggest focus is just trying to keep his body healthy so that he can play late into his years. And so that's what he's doing, right? I'm, I'm going to stay healthy. I'm going to try to make sure my legs keep kicking, you know. I like to play with mobility, so I want to make sure I can still do that. And he's, he's just kind of settling into it. It is what it is. And he's, of course, he's going to give 100% because he wants desperately to win a championship. He wants another one before his time is up. But again, I, I just think, and we've been hearing for probably two years, maybe maybe a little longer, him talk more about the finality of it and realizing the finality of it. And, and again, it, just all this stuff points to him kind of settling into accepting his fate, you know, being much closer to Brett Favre now and talking with him and, and, and having a lot of conversations about retirement. And what it's like. And I'm sure Brett has told him, you know, how hard it is to accept it, but it's been great and all this, you know, whatever. 
You know, he's got a lot of relationships with other guys. Most of the guys he started his career with are done. Everybody he plays with is a young gun now. And now they just essentially, possibly drafted his replacement. And again, that for me is kind of the final. If he had a little strand left of fighting this, and I'm going to be here, and I'm going to show everybody. And you know, he kind of talked about that earlier in the offseason. You know, even if they draft a quarterback, I'm going to show everybody that I'm still the guy. I'm going to win. Not exactly how he said it, but again, I'm just wondering how much of that fire is left in him of I'm going to show everybody when everything just over, all the hits keep coming. And at some point, it's kind of like, you know what? It is what it is. I'm going to just take care of myself, control what I can control, which is literally what he's been saying for a while. And whatever happens, happens. And again, the only reason I bring that up is it's hard to have both. It's hard to, on one one side, be completely fired up and I'm going to show everybody I'm going to take on the world. I'm going to be the top quarterback. I'm going to win multiple Super Bowls. And on the other hand, say, you know what? I might be done in a couple of years. I don't know. And and not just realize it, but accept it. To actually accept that that this is this is basically it. And be okay with that. And also be fight. It's just, it, I don't think that that's very easy to do. So again, the positive here, it's not as though if he doesn't have a fire, it's over, right? Drew Brees knows he's just about done and he's having a great success. And I really think a lot of it is going to rely on him settling into not just what's coming in the future, but also settling into letting LaFleur run this offense and, and not feeling like he needs to be, you know, the, the, the main driver of this offense. Let other people step up. Let LaFleur step up. Let him be the weapon. Allow yourself to just be a piece, a major piece, but allow yourself to just be a piece of this offense. You don't have to be the magic man. You don't have to be the superhero. You'll have your opportunities to be a hero, no question. But it doesn't have to be the first play of the first quarter. Right? If we need a final drive with the last two minutes, yeah, put, you know, put your cape on. But allow A.J. Dillon to take the brunt. Allow Aaron Jones to... to you know, do what he does in the run game as well as a receiver. Allow Devontae to take on a, 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 a massive role and Funchess and your tight ends and all these guys and your defense and Matt LaFleur to be the, the intelligent one. Let him figure it out. You just, you know, fine. You guys want to take over? You think you can handle this? Fine. I, you know, whatever. I don't mean that in a bitter sense, but, you know, if you guys are going to move on without me, let's see how good of a job you can actually do. I hope that's what happens. And as, as fatalistic as it sounds, and I, I don't mean for it to sound that way, I think it can have a, a positive impact. And I think it may actually mean more longevity for Aaron Rodgers. If he can settle into this, and if he has a revival in his career, It's it, listen, it's entirely possible that Aaron Rodgers has a second wind in his career, and also that Jordan Love just doesn't really pan out. And we see Aaron Rodgers play here into his 40s. We might have another four years, and maybe he, who knows, maybe he gets another one-year extension. Maybe he's here another five years, six years. Who knows? We don't know any of that. But again, everything that I've said for the most part outside of literally what he said is is just speculation and just thinking out loud. There is absolutely nothing here, at least from what we heard so far, that the national media should have any reason to run. They're going to anyways. They have already, but anybody that actually has the integrity to listen before they run with the the nonsense already understands that there's nothing scandalous here and really although i can't do this because i have a podcast the the correct response to all this is we just have to wait and see there there's there's an unlimited amount of outcome aaron Rodgers might get hurt before the season even starts and jordan love takes over aaron Rodgers might be here for the next five years i mean literally anything that you can dream up is a possibility to some degree or another but uh we'll we'll leave it there and, and again I'm not sure exactly what this means for going forward. Maybe tomorrow we'll continue this and we'll push everything else back or we'll just leave it at that. I don't know. Figure that out. But I got to get going. You folks have yourselves a fantastic day. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.